Thanks uh, to each of you for uh, being a part of this last uh, number of days and as we continue this conversation uh, this afternoon and onward. Um, because we've met almost everyone, uh, or most everyone up here has, has been on these panels already, I won't bother taking the time to individually introduce everyone except for a couple folks uh, who ha you haven't seen up here yet. Um, and I'll actually start with Donovan because while he was moderating yesterday's panel, he didn't quite introduce himself. Uh, so here's Donovan Hone, uh, the author of Moby Duck, <laughs> the true story of 28,800 bath toys lost at sea and the beachcombers, oceanographers, environmentalists, and fools, including the author who went in search of them. Uh, Don was also a contributing editor uh, at Harper's Magazine, formerly a features editor there. Yeah, senior, senior editor and features editor at GQ. Yeah. Um, sitting to my left here is Josip Novakovic. Uh, we emigrated from Croatia, uh, the former Yugoslavia, to the U.S. In his, at, at the age of 20. Uh, he's published a dozen books, including a novel, April Fool's Day, five story collections, and three collections of narrative essays. And on the far end here uh, is Nikolai Grozny, uh, who's a Bulgarian author and has written six books of fiction and one memoir, Turtle Feet. So we're glad to have everyone up here. And I think everyone knows Demeter and Elif and Ledet and Benjamin. I'm Jeremy. Thank you. Um, so the idea uh, of, of thinking about writing being either public or private is obviously, as we've been discussing, like genre, uh, a bit of a fallacy. Um, we divided these panels up yesterday's and today's uh, with the knowledge that writing is both public and private. Uh, even at its most literal levels, we write, it's a private act. We publish, it's a public act. Um, the relationship between the reader and the writer is both a private one, but also strangely public, because we're often, many of us, reading the same, same books and poems and stories and novels and texts. Um, but we thought by dividing them up this way, it would be an interesting way to come at the same subject matter from opposite directions uh, and sort of keep blurring those boundaries. So while we are talking about private narratives, um, it's really a, a continuation of yesterday's dialogue. Um, and from two days ago, uh, I want to actually start with Lydette. Um, if you don't mind. <laughs> I'm so ungraciously just went out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because you said uh, something I found uh, quite interesting and, and jotted down during our first panel together. Um, you were talking about your memoir and you said that you had written it for those who are still there. Um, and it got me thinking about that idea of who, maybe we can begin with you, who you write towards or with that book in particular, but then to the other panelists who would like to weigh in that idea of who, who, who you're writing toward or for. I mean, obviously we all would love a large audience of our work, but there are ways in which I think we envision um, almost in that Eliot way of the ideal reader, but in some instances we're really writing towards specific people, and I thought maybe we could begin there. Yeah, okay. Um, I haven't really thought about this question, but um, obviously I would have loved to have written a book that was lyrical and beautiful, and everyone would say, oh, it's such a beautiful literary book. But um, as I started working on the subject matter, and this is a book that was framed by a story of my husband and I gutting and rebuilding a house together. And we, we did it ourselves in nine months when we were both working full time. And so it's insane. It was an insane thing. And I did not want to be doing it. So I was a reluctant traveler. And, uh, but I was the one that kept the notes about what we had done. And so I had this sort of these notes in front of me and I thought well maybe this would be a book and I started sort of writing about this project and I thought this is the most boring book in the world. So I set it aside for a long time and then I mentioned earlier those essays that I had written never meant to be published um, but I began to realize that they were um, stories about houses where I had lived mm -hmm. and so I began to think about this concept of home and houses and, um, and, and the gutting and rebuilding of a house as a sort of structuring metaphor for uh, the story of my own, um, my own story, which I will not bore you with here. But, um, so I began to see that how they fit together and how um, they, that, that those essays complicated the story of what my husband and I were doing. Um, and it, in a way, it was a very uncool story to tell. And I think some of my friends maybe were a little horrified that I was telling it. 
but I realized that that was the story that I really needed to tell. And um, so that it, it, it feels like that has been the, the place where it has resonated most with, with some readers. Other readers can see it in a different way, but that, those are the readers that the mo are the most meaningful to me mm -hmm. because um, I had to work really hard in a solitary way in thinking my way out of a very um, confining and restricting uh, way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a guide for how to get out. <laughs> Question of audience for other people writing, who you're writing towards in particular projects or how that shifts and change from project to project? Can I just say, I'm interested in some people said or have said over the last few days, like I don't ever think about who's reading my book and I'm fascinated by this because I am always thinking about that because especially my first book, which was about uh, a Brazilian writer that I was trying to present to an international audience. The whole point of this book was it had to be interesting, like it had to be attractive, it had to make people want to know about her and want to lead to what did happen afterwards, which was the translation of and the revival of her work, not only in English but in other countries. And so I was really aware of like, how do I make this interesting to people, even though, because also because people were always telling me, I was young and sort of I had, promise and I had a great future and then everybody was like why are you writing about this ridiculous Brazilian lady that's dead and that nobody's ever heard of and her books aren't translated and nobody cares and um, so I really felt pressure like I felt that and then um, the last book I did about Susan Sontag was had a different kind of pressure because you know Susan Sontag had like you know the number of collateral damage, you know, ex-girlfriends and ex-like friends and, and other writers and rivals and people who loved her and people who hated her and people who, who thought one thing of her and people who thought one other thing of her. It's really hard to think like all these people are going to be reading this book. They all live in like a 20 block radius of Central Park. Like, <laughs> and, um, and they're all literary people in some form, cultural people. You know, they're all going to be mouthing off about everything that is wrong about it. And I feel like it's, it's that, I felt a lot of pressure from that, but it doesn't stop me. I mean, I think Demeter and I were talking about, like you're writing a book in English about a Bulgarian that'll be read in English, where nobody knows anything about Bulgarians. And in Bulgaria, they're gonna be judging you because they're gonna think, oh, he's selling us down the river, you know? And so everybody, at a certain point, I think the Zen flow kind of comes when you just think. You're gonna think what you think about it, and I don't really care. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this is um, this has been a, a huge issue for me because if you know, writing a book about this Bulgarian writer um, who is sort of famous for this murder, you know, for the way he died, but uh, nobody really knows anything about him, and also the fact that Bulgaria is probably the least known country together with Albania you know, from the former Soviet bloc. I mean, it's true, yeah, to a certain extent, you know, you had like this, you know, the, you had like, you know, Czechoslovakia and Poland and Hungary and everybody knows about them, I guess, because of, you know, the, you know, 56 and 68 and then in Poland, Solidarność and somehow in the Western world, they're much more, much more well known. And Bulgaria is this sort of country in, somewhere in the backwater and, and, and you have to explain every single thing about the context and about like the Communist Party and who Zhivkov is, um, you know, and if I were writing for a Bulgarian audience, I was thinking, you know, how would, how that book would be different. I mean, there is a book by a Bulgarian, a wonderful Bulgarian investigative journalist, Christo Christov, who, who did a big like 1,000 page book on the murder of Markov. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, he translated this book into English. Um, it's, and, and, you know, it's hard to read sometimes because, I mean, he does provide a lot of context, but, but it seems so geared toward the Bulgarian audience. Um, so, so definitely writing in another language for, I wouldn't say an American audience, but more of an international audience, um, you know, the, the requirements are completely different. But also, I was just recently speaking to some people and, and you know, as, as Philip was, was, was saying the other day also about Rwanda, you know, um, you have on the one hand, oh, this person and who he was and he was the member of a communist party or man, the member of the presidium or whatever. But Bulgarians, the fact is that Bulgarians don't know their history 
at all, actually. Of, you know, only professional historians or literary. Nobody knows, Nobody knows history. That's true. Uh, but but it seems like even even there are, there are this 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 studies right now asking young Bulgarians about the past, and you know, uh, eighty percent of them have not heard of you know Markov's work, and and like fifty or sixty percent you know don't know what the Berlin Wall was. Um, so so even even in a place which, which experienced that history, suddenly, I mean, I guess because our culture has become so dynamic and with the internet and that things changing so fast and we, don't, we lack a coherent sort of homogeneous narrative now, so everybody has these bits of knowledge about things but we don't share any, any kind of historical knowledge or, or anything like that. So, so I found out that actually even if I, this book will be translated into Bulgarian, of course, but I don't think we would, I would have to get anything out of it because I think it will be useful also for a Bulgarian audience and for people who don't know much about that history. So, so in, this, in a sense, you know, I was debating, oh, is it for an international audience? No, actually, it's also for a Bulgarian audience, even though it explains a lot of context and stuff like that. So, so that's how at least I see it. We'll see you know, how it ends up all like, being, but yeah. That's good. Yeah. I uh, I, I would agree that in the, in the old days, educated people were such a small, like if you look at the 19th century novel, people who were reading it had all been to basically the same kind of school and they'd read the same books and they knew Greek and Latin or, you know, whatever. And now we're writing for wider and wider audiences and the canon is weaker than it ever was. And in a way, that's, a, that's kind of a pain because you don't know who, the, who you're writing for. But in another way, it's kind of wonderful and it... it I don't know, I, I think a lot about science fiction and how um, you read a science fiction book and you don't know the history of that world and you, you don't know anything about it, but a, a really good one can explain you the rules or let you deduce the rules without necessarily explaining them all. And I've also been thinking a lot about all unhappy families being unhappy after their own fashion and, and also about novels, how if you try to tell someone the plot of a novel, it's often ridiculous and you're like how, who would read a book about that like a, <laughs> and the, the stories are so specific and so you know like if you were trying to do the elevator pitch which I guess you know not everyone has to do the way that young Americans have to do elevator pitches but um, the reason they work is that it takes very specific little problems to enable someone to tune into the universal questions that they have and if you just go up to someone and say you know you know marriage and intimacy are hard and being young is disorienting no one's going to be like right on man but if you like tell if you if you tell them some crazy story even if it's something that didn't happen to them that that's how you tap into those universal feelings and i think that's always like a game and always a balancing act that one's trying to do Um, um, in my memoir uh, called Turtle Feet, um, which uh, was about the five years I spent in India, um, I, um, I wrote it, I think, with my sister in mind. I was thinking that, you know, she always really liked my stories from India, and I would write her, send her letters from India, and and she would laugh and say, yeah, these stories are fantastic. This is so funny. And your friend Tsar, you know, that didn't have a country and he had to hide from the police with you and, you know, him trying to fly over the, you know, Indian-Pakistani border. That's so funny. And then I wrote a book. And then she called me and said, this is not funny at all. You know, it's, too, <laughs> it's really personal. And I think you really hurt a lot of people's feelings. And uh, so... Um, but we, we need to kind of construct, a, you know, some sort of imaginary person that is sitting there with us and like really getting what we're talking about, like laughing or crying and, you know, nodding when they need to nod. And I think it helps. But um, with my fi fiction books, I've really stopped thinking of that imaginary person. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Oh, yeah. Anthony, yeah. 
Yeah, we're going to do it. Yeah. I'll pick up on something. Does it work now? I'd like to, to pick up on something that Mitko said. I completely agree with what you said, that uh, Bulgarians don't know a thing about history, and that 90% of Bulgarians have no idea about history. But then I would like to add that over 90% of all Bulgarians are actually great historians. I mean, every conversation in this country, especially after two years, inevitably turns to history, any kind of history. You've got distant history, like what happened in the Middle Ages. You can have favorite bits of Bulgarian history, like the Ottoman yoke. Uh, terminology is very important, because if you listen to typical Bulgarians talking about history, little words can tell you of their current political inclinations. Like I said on purpose, I used the word yoke. It's actually occupation, and it's not Turkish yoke, it's Ottoman occupation, that's the right historical term. But if anybody would be telling you about the Turkish yoke, that means that would speak of that person's current political inclinations. Same thing with communism, same thing with anti-communism, same thing with the interwar history of Bulgaria. I mean, all of those things are very, very charged, politically charged. Probably because Bulgarians at the moment live in a kind of post-Stalinist society where there is lack of critical thinking, uh, there, is, um, there is a lot of propaganda on all, 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 all sides, left, right, and center. Um, there is fear, there is repression, all, all of those things are present. And it's probably because of that that uh, people tend to get lost in history. And I think this is more, more negative than positive because, because as people are so deeply uh, into history, they, they, tend to stop, uh, they tend to stop talking about the present and especially about the future. I mean, they quarrel over historical things. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the Bulgarian parliament at the moment. They cannot pass any law because they quarrel about what happened in 1955. Uh, which all reminds me of, uh, and probably this is my definition of uh, documentary writing and, and being a good documentary writer. It reminds me of, of, of a film which I saw many years ago as a young man, and that is uh, Indiana Jones, the second insert, I think it was Indiana Jones, and uh, I don't remember even whether it was the last crusade or uh, Temple of the Dooms, yeah. Uh, Harrison Ford, opening scene, Harrison Ford talking to his students, telling them that this is, uh, th this is archaeology, he says. I, I quote from memory. Uh, the, uh, we are archaeologists, so we are supposed to be archaeologists, and we're interested in facts. Facts. We are not in search of the truth. If you are in search of the truth, I'd recommend the philosophy department just down the corridor. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe I can build off that. We'll pivot off that comment. And... <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, I think so the job... One minute. The job of, of a good documentary writer is to make a connection. I'm starting, I'm starting my stopwatch. Okay. Connect, connection between the two. I mean, get the facts right, and then put those facts in context, and get the background right. And that's you know, your job. Thank you. All right. Because this is, has the word private in our title, I'm not going to talk about uh, Moby Duck so much. Um, uh, which does have, it does weave autobiography in. And it is, it's curious with nonfiction. I suspect most people on this uh, panel who have used the first person extensively, you do get readers out there who inevitably, well, things happen. They, they get annoyed. They, using the first person is somehow inherently a narcissistic act. Uh, they like their nonfiction served neat. Uh, you know, no, get yourself out of it. Well, I think there are all sorts of excellent reasons to make use of the first person, um, certainly in the case of my book, it felt absolutely necessary to give it coherence. Um, uh, but I, always, I thought I'd think briefly about, before I wrote that book, I wrote, uh, it took me several years to figure out how to do it. I wrote a long, um, I think it's a personal essay or history, less than a memoir, um, but it's about um, my childhood and my mother, uh, who was clinically depressive and all this stuff that I think is really hard to write about in a way that doesn't feel 
therapeutic, um, where the reader doesn't feel cast in the role of assessing um, the private lives of other people, um, passing judgment. Um, I called it falling confessions of a lapsed forest Christian, and I used the word confessions very much thinking about St. Augustine, because religion is very much part of it. Um, but I worked really hard to, to, I had to in some ways create a, a, an odd amount of distance in, this, in the essay in order to tell the, the, the material that was most freighted with emotion. Um, this is something I think I, I don't know if this is a good thing or bad, but I know I do it in all of my work when I want to bring in the, in the personal is I kind of displace it. So my essay will be about chasing ducks that fell off a container ship, but furtively it's really about my anxieties of becoming a father. Or in this case, I was writing about um, the transcendental tradition that is in some ways influenced by and influences Christianity in America and a particular mountain in California. All these other things I need to talk about in order to access um, the private. There's almost like, I feel like it's rather than coming on directly. Um, and in, for me, I think this is, I guess I'd maybe disagree if I understood Anthony correctly. It's never, the facts alone are kind of never enough. Maybe it's the fact that I'm a lapsed transcendentalist and want my facts to be transcendent. But I, I, do, I do feel like I need to get to these moments of, of where it has come to, it doesn't have to be a, a big epiphany, but where there's, they've somehow been, um, the dry facts have been, there's a current that's running through them uh, and they are sparking off of one another and it does create some sense of, of meaning. I don't want to be the lazy panelist here. I think I'm the only one who hasn't spoken, so uh, it's time for me to do a little bit of work. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of audience, uh, my primary audience is uh, the story itself. Um, I, I'm talking to the story, the story is talking to itself and to me, and uh, uh, I'm writing it because I don't understand something. And uh, I cannot uh, think of an audience uh, yet. Uh, why would I present something I don't understand to anybody? Uh, I'm struggling with myself to begin with, and uh, the story, the narrative is there to uh, reach beyond what I already know through my daydreams, you know, and uh, putting words down on the page uh, somehow creates uh, order out of chaos, uh, out of my impressions and uh, desires and fears and uh, fragmentary knowledge. Uh, so. Uh, but there the primary struggle is actually to uh, reach beyond my understanding and myself. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I mean, if I were a better journalist, probably I wouldn't have to resort to fiction. But uh, I went to Vinkovci. Uh, uh, my brother-in-law was the only man left on the block, uh, which was uh, 200 uh, uh, yards away from Serbian Hovitzers. Uh, and he showed me when I visited him a hole uh, uh, in the foundation and the neighbor's house which was completely incinerated. Uh, so I, I wondered why he didn't uh, flee. I thought, is he extraordinarily brave? Uh, I don't remember him as such. Uh, uh, what's going on here? And I interviewed him and I didn't get an answer. Uh, he basically opened the, the Bible and uh, read verses. Uh, and then he showed me his bees. Uh, and then I said, okay, well, I'll have to uh, now imagine what it is like to be him but I don't believe in God anymore. Uh, I'm an agnostic or whatever, so I cannot really understand him from that standpoint, except I can go into some kind of logistics. I used to be very religious, and I know many people who are. So uh, anyhow, I, I had to imagine his uh, daily life, his bees, how he ate uh, uh, bread with butter and honey, and uh, get into his sensations and his mind, I, I probably failed, but uh, for me it was, uh, it was the only way to, to get somehow to his experience, to put these things together. His German shepherd, his, uh, his bees. You know, some people are really scared of bees, uh, and uh, I don't understand that, uh, but we are very different that way. You know, uh, I have a very brave friend who runs away when the bee shows up. Uh, well, he's allergic. He would end up in a hospital with uh, asthmatic attacks and, per you know, uh, so th he has a medical reason to be scared. I don't, uh, I'm not allergic to bees. Uh, I'm afraid of snakes, you know, so I can, I can relate to the fear of bees through my fear of snakes. Uh, so uh, anyhow, I put emotions uh, in and all kinds of details and verses from the Bible and then uh, 
the impressions of, of the city of Inkovci. I was going around looking at uh, the topography, so a lot of the city comes in, the bakery, the smell, the smells from the bakery. So I reconstruct his world and his experience, and uh, I probably fail. But uh, for me, that was uh, that was the enterprise there. The the, the audience was the story, f and uh, his experience somehow to reach beyond my own experience into his uh, to give enough. Well, enough uh, sensations, enough thoughts. Uh, what is it like to think like him? And uh, after that, well, if someone will read it, uh, let them read it. But uh, that's not my problem at all. Uh, I think I want to pivot off of something that both the Donovan brought up and then Yosef was sort of coming at from a slightly different angle. Um, it's the idea of, uh, when, well, let me back up. Um, when Philip Gravich was giving his lecture a couple of nights ago, Philip, you were talking, um, uh, or maybe it was on the panel, about uh, interviews. Uh, and you know, he said, somebody doesn't want to talk to me, they don't want, fine, that's, you know, go. But when we're writing, um, especially memoir or um, nonfiction, we don't, the people who are writing about often don't ask, get, you know, we don't ask them if they can be a part of our stories. Um, we just weave them in, family members in particular. Right, I want, want to write him. So, for those of you who do write um, in that in that manner, I'm curious to know how you negotiate that. I think fairly fraught terrain. I, I, I peripherally saw both Elephant Donovan nodding <laughs> as I was talking. Someone, if you can start. <laughs> oh man! Um, what a misery! Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I have to say about that, about un, uh, dra dragooning unwilling family members into your story, except that it's a constant minefield and it's kind of a microcosm for how in the world our subjectivity is always impeding on someone else's subjectivity. And uh, I guess it, it could make you particularly sensitive to that and then that might be a good thing. I think that's, I've scraped the bottom of the barrel of what I can, what I've <laughs> learned from, uh, from, for example, writing about my mother, and I think that might be just about it. Well, except to say that in the end, in the end, you kind of, if, if, you're, if you're reporting in Rwanda and you're, you're talking to someone and um, you're not really in a position to say, well, if you don't like what I write, uh, go ahead and write your own thing because there's certain power imbalances there. But at least with your own family, usually you're in sort of the same socioeconomic bracket. So, um, for example, uh, my mother wasn't delighted by um, the portrayal of the mother in my new novel, and she's now writing an autobiographical screenplay where um, <laughs> she's, uh, she's replaced, instead of a daughter called Elif, she now has a son called Orhan, which <laughs> I think is very resourceful of her, and I'm supporting that project um, with all of the energy I have. I, I feel bad because mothers are going to get it badly here from both of us, and um, uh, and they probably don't necessarily. Don't sure we, it. yeah, and dads can be schmucks too, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Uh, spe speaking as a father, right? But the um, uh, for me, the the I, I thought a lot about. I think this you get this question. In fact, I've been told this once um, this week that, well, if you want to write about these painful events from your childhood, or not even painful, meaningful, memorable events that you feel like you are material, well, just wait till everyone dies. Yeah. That's the answer. And for me, this is one of the, one of the biggest problems with, with how I framed yesterday's panel of just write, you get to write your own story. Well, my own story is totally entangled with my mother's and my siblings, and I could not tell my own story and somehow leave theirs out is impossible. And then there's, there's something supposedly high-minded about waiting for the people to die, but then sometimes you're at a cocktail party and you meet someone who's waiting for their parents to die, and yeah. you can tell, and it's not... It's I just, I, I want to jump in on there. First of all, um, because I just read this great novel that I, I reviewed or interviewed the author of a Japanese novel about how in Western rich countries, well, Western, Jap Japan is not a Western country, but it's a rich country and they have really good healthcare and people live forever. 
and uh-huh. it's about this woman who's like in her 60s and she's still waiting for her mother to die because her mother is on some intensive care nursing home something and like she has a tube in her nose and she's like being you know soiling herself and yet she's gonna live another 10 years and she's gonna have to go every day and I thought this was such a beautiful metaphor for the family situation in general. <laughs> I mean, it happens to so many people, whether it's illustrated that blatantly or not. Um, people tend to stick around longer than animals do. You know, like animals grow up and then they're done, like the little seagulls we saw on the island. Like they're going to fly off and that's going to be it. And there's going to be another egg next year. Um, whereas people seem trapped into these relationships and, and, so I don't know. Do we need to ask that much permission? I mean, do we really? I, I mean, I think I don't. I didn't ask permission from my right. mother, and I did. T- I did things like remove my brother's name so he wouldn't be Googled when headhunters were evaluating a job application. <coughs> you know, right. I took. I took right. care. Um, but I to, not to, to reduce it. But I think what what Philip Gravich said yesterday about telling public stories of other people's that it comes down to how you tell it, I think is no less the case if you're telling right. a private story. The reader will trust you if you feel, they feel like you're not being cruel uh, or, or seeking something other, other than um, the literary demands of the essay. See, it helps to write in a foreign language. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so you go away and uh, you write in a foreign language and then people you write about maybe will not, uh, not read it. Uh, and. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Uh, I knew a policeman. Uh, he was actually a great chess player. Uh, I remember how he beat me once, even though I had a natural advantage near a swimming pool. And anyway, later he uh, killed a man in a bar, uh, uh, shot him, was, was in prison, came out, and uh, he then appeared a little menacing after it. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I based a part of... Uh, well, I based the story on him, put it in a larger story, and uh, then uh, it was translated to Croatian and published, and I, I ran into him later, and I, I looked at him suspiciously, wondering whether he was mad, whether he read the story, and he looked at me, and uh, we talked, and we remembered our chess playing, I invited him for wine, and we drank, and we didn't mention uh, the fact that I may have abused him in my fiction, uh, which he may have known. Some, some people may have told him, but uh, it all went very well, and he was an alcoholic, and he was uh, extremely grateful that uh, I helped him get drunk that morning. So uh, <laughs> I think it was all okay. I was just going to say that this, this thing of waiting for somebody to die is kind of like, isn't it like a major theme in 19th century novels, except they're waiting for the inheritance. And basically, the person who won't die because people are waiting for their inheritance, and that this is obviously the ultimate form of life-promoting, you know, it's the, it's the greatest medicine in the world, is to have young people waiting for you to die. You won't. You know, there are all these characters who hang on through tooth and claw, and, and these people who make a mess of their 20s and 30s and 40s in these 19th century novels, because they know that when that person drops dead, suddenly they'll come into this estate, or this piece of land, or this position, or this title, um, and all the sibling rivalries that go along with that are very similar to essentially the memoirist's problem. I mean, it's a literary problem that gets kind of, we don't write about money for some reason, like the 20th and 21st century novel have abandoned the incredibly fantastic theme of all human existence, which is money, and now we write about psychology, but it seems like they kind of just use it as a metaphor, maybe. Like that, or, or anyway, it's, it's become a bit of a metaphor for memoirists. I liked an Illich novel I was saying to her yesterday. She has this line, and this is really specific to our socioeconomic background where we all pretend like we are totally the same as everybody else. And this is a real theme in American denial of class. You know, this is something we could use some Marxism. Mm. But and someone in her novel says, didn't you, you know, my family has a lot of money, so I'll buy the drinks or something. And the other girl says, didn't we, don't we all have a lot of money? Mm. And it's like this hilarious moment of Americana because people really don't allow that theme even in a conversation. And you know, this is all of French literature. Like Balzac wouldn't have had a career without this idea. And um, anyway, so I think, I think it's, it's, it's fun to just mention it almost because it's so obviously omitted. Anyone want to ask a question of someone else? I was going to say something a little bit here. I don't know how 
pertinent it is, but you were talking about um, sort of your, your um, detaching from really personal material. And I'll put on another hat here. When I was um, an acquiring editor at University of Nebraska Press, I acquired a lot of nonfiction, um, and we had a series called American Lives. So you can imagine the kinds of manuscripts I got and read. And um, what I saw so much of was really undigested pain, you know, and uh, just this kind of need to take revenge through this writing act. And, um, and it was really like amazing, you know, these really people who had published many books, they were very sophisticated writers, but when it came to writing a personal things, they just did not, they were, had not digested that material. So I think that's really important, um, that sort of sense of when you're writing about something very hard and personal and hot, you need to write cold, you know, check off, this is, this is uh, old stuff. Um, but it, it's, it, it's hard because if someone's writing about pain too closely, we all just like, you know, <laughs> say, I don't, I don't want to go there. I can't be your, your therapist. So it's very important. I had a question for Nikolai, um, just because yeah. I'm interested in, because your book is a memoir, but it's not a memoir of childhood. It's a memoir of adult lived experience. And yet it too transits between a public, it's a public narrative that takes us into what, from what I know, is a kind of private, cloistered world. Uh, I wonder how you negotiated that. Um, yeah, I mean, first, um, with Turtle Feet, which is uh, my memoir, I, um, I wrote it as a, as a novel. It was a huge novel. It was like 500 pages. I wrote it in English, and then I threw it away. And I actually used parts of it for my, um, for my MFA thesis. I didn't even read it. I just took it out of the drawer, and I just put it there. And it was my MFA thesis in Brown. Um, <laughs> And I didn't. I, I don't even remember what I wrote very well. It was just uh, it, it, the whole cast, all the characters were there. I was there, and um, it was in first person as well. But um, something it just it didn't work. Something didn't work. It, um, um, and, and that to me is is a lesson in 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 figuring out what the, the benefits of fiction and nonfiction are, and um, in um, trying to decide why this narrative doesn't work. You know, it's a true narrative. It was an autobiographical novel. Everything in it was true. And it didn't work, you know. I myself didn't laugh. Uh, there was nothing to laugh at. Uh, it, was just, uh, it was just kind of dull. And then um, at some point I, I started uh, writing, you know, jotting down different memories, you know, and details and looked, out, looked at my notebooks from that time uh, of conversations that I'd had with uh, with this star character that I lived with uh, for four years in a in a mud shack in the Himalayas with snakes and scorpions and spiders and different things and and I started to realize that you know if I just stop making imposing yet another layer of narrative onto something that was already a narrative, it was much more naked and apparent and punchy and funny and uh, and sad. And, and so I, I wrote it as a memoir. Um, and, um, and, and, and the thing is, I'm, I'm very fa old fashioned about, about these things. I, and in both fiction and nonfiction, I feel that um, if you're representing something, uh, you know, a human being or even an animal, anything, uh, you kind of have to, even if it's an extremely um, hurtful thing or a hurtful person, um, we have to love them in some sense. I mean, that's very old-fashioned, but I just really believe in that. Uh, I just don't think that it's, um, it makes for great literature when um, things are just... Um, you treat characters, or even your, the people that you're interviewing as some sort of you know, cockroaches that you know, they have a, a fight, or you watch them run around the house. And it's not... You, uh, so I think that the, the main question that we were talking about was how, um, how we present other people without um, showing too much or hurting them. And inevitably, if, uh, if you write a nonfiction piece, someone might get hurt. But I think that if the intention is, even you know, if you're thinking of something, someone who has uh, hurt you in some way or abused you or or lied about you or slandered you. If, if you 
try to understand that person and, and in a sense, love that person, even as you're writing about that person um, and, and exposing things that are, are hurtful to you and will be hurtful to, to that person. I think that that's the right mindset. And, um, in, and um, for instance, I, I wrote an, an autobiographical novel called Wunderkind about my, my high school, which is practically true. And I could have just put memoir and, and changed a few things. Uh, but um, uh, even then, I was trying very hard. Uh, there was this, the director of the music school who, who would kick kids out and, and slap people in the face and, and kick. And it was, she was just like a psychopath. And then, and then uh, one of the students that she kicked out of the school cursed her on the way out as she was being kicked out. And she cursed her and told her, you know, you're going to die. And the director died in a month. So that was a kind of a weird thing for all of us, you know. We really hated that woman. And then she was cursed and she died. But I remember at her funeral, you know, it didn't really feel like a revenge, you know. We, we still went along with the funeral and we were kind of sad that she died. And we felt like that wasn't really right and that what happened, you know, even though she kind of... Maybe she deserved it in, a, in an action movie, but in real life, you know, she still was a person and she was a mother. And so everything, I mean, all of these things. So I tried to put this in the novel and, um, that I wrote. Um, and, um, but it's a very old-fashioned thing, but I think that that's a way to, to avoid the, the chasm of, of, of writing a revenge piece, right? Or just trying to hurt someone. Maybe I can actually pick up just a little bit, and then we'll sort of turn to audience questions here in a moment. But um, Nikolai, you were talking about the movement in that back and forth between novel and, and memoir, and a lot of us up here write both, I think, fiction and nonfiction. Uh, and maybe I can actually ask Ella if you've done interviews about this a little bit recently with your book about decisions of sort of how to approach that story. And can you talk a little bit maybe about sort of moving it into novel? <coughs> Sure. Or the choices I, involved. In yeah. I don't I don't find them that different. I was actually as Nikolai was talking, I was just remembering something that he said this morning when we were talking about how miserable life is. And uh <laughs> I I was we were talking about Buddhism and, and Christianity and he said that the basic insight is how to metabolize the injuries of, of the world and turn and to metabolize pain and to turn it into something else. And that really resonated with what Ledette said about um, coming across undigested pain in writing. And this actually reminds me of how I was, there was a certain point in my life when I was teaching um, an academic writing uh, workshop at Stanford um, and actually, at the same time, I had just started freelancing for The New Yorker, and uh, my, my professor at Stanford, who thought my dissertation was too discursive, was like, oh, are we now all writing for The New Yorker? And then my editor at The New Yorker was like, oh, academic writing, I suppose they give you very straightforward things, and you just make them abstruse and throw in a bit of jargon and say, off you go. Um, <laughs> So I, I was just like, I felt like I was in the middle of these, I was like, can you two just like to get a room and like leave me out of it? But um, anyway, so I, I was teaching these kids, um, it was kind of an emergency class that had been convened because um, there were these kids in an interdisciplinary humanities program who had to write an interdisciplinary thesis and they were trying to drag in so many different things that their heads were exploding. So like one girl was like, I think that if you look at the mob mobiles of Alexander Calder and you analyze how they move, you can derive a complexity theory from that that actually you can use to predict aspects of emerging nanotechnology. And you would be like, <laughs> and you'd be like, what? Are, okay, what's the nanotechnology? And she's like, it's like it's in lotion. <laughs> and and then there there were. Um, and there were other people who had been doing archival research and and I noticed that and, and they had given me these instructions saying, you know, you're you're the writing teacher, your job is to make sure there's a topic sentence and you know that it's supported by and that they're using footnotes correctly, they're doing observing MLA format, and you don't get in there with the con content too much. 
And I noticed that one thing that the students tended to do was they suffered a lot. They suffered in their research, especially the, the ones who were, who were going to the archive, but also the ones who were studying complexity theory. And they would try to reproduce that suffering kind of chronologically in their piece and sort of walk the person through, you know, then I was looking for this, and then I saw that person's name, and then I looked up this thing and this other. And then it, a, a big part of teaching that class was, okay, you don't walk the person through your whole, you know, seven stations of the misery of your life. You, what you do is you, you try to process it into some delightful journey and then you tell them that journey and you have to let go of the, the wild goose chase that happened in the archive that you know, led to something that's not totally relevant to your topic sentence. You have to leave that out and that's a painful thing to do but, um, but it's actually not wasted. No work that you do is ever wasted. And I find myself retracing that when I'm writing nonfiction and when I'm writing fiction that there's, you know, a lot of it is to process some kind of horrible experience that I had and it is very tempting to sort of expect or invite the reader to uh, re-experience that whole thing with me and the thing that I have to try to do is to metabolize it into something else and and sort of fast forward them up to the to the end and just guide them through that in a deceptively chronological way. Angela? Yeah. This is very interesting discussion, thank you. Um, we talked a little bit about rep representing individuals and how to protect those individuals when you're writing something very um, personal about them. And uh, I had a slightly different angle that I think maybe Mitko and Jeremy will relate to because as I come from ethnomusicology, which is essentially anthropology. And so the question for us is always, how do you represent cultures? Because uh, you can't really change their names, especially when you're writing something that's you know, clearly nonfiction. Um, and those people within those cultures that you're working with have a very definite idea of how they want to be represented. And does that in your work lead to a type of self-censorship or how do you navigate? I mean, every culture has a, has a narrative about itself that oftentimes as an outsider, as an anthropologist, as a journalist, you would like to dispute, <laughs> but you can't just sort of change the name and, you know, sort of. <laughs> and so how do you, how do you, when you're writing nonfiction about a culture that will clearly read this later and have this discussion with you, what, what are your ways of, of navigating that, um, that personal relationship? Yeah. Uh, can I answer that? Yeah. What just yeah. I, mean, I had a really clear experience of that during my first biography, which was about a Brazilian, uh, which is a culture that I know pretty well, but I'm not Brazilian even though I'm not also totally un-Brazilian. You know, I've, it's almost, um, yeah, like, so, I mean, I, I get it, and I know where the sensibilities lie, and I know how it needs to be represented so that Brazilians won't be offended, but on the other hand, how it can be, uh, how any kind of representation people take issue to. And especially when you're writing, I have this big collection that I'm very proud of that nobody cares about, but it is really interesting, which is about, um, people from Latin America visiting the United States. And it's, so it's travel literature that tries to flip around the dynamic because usually like white guys from Heidelberg or Chicago will like journey through the Amazon or they'll go to like the Balkans or they'll go to the Gobi Desert and they'll come back with some shocking report. And um, totally safe in the knowledge that like the people in Albania or Mongolia are just never gonna read this. And this is the tradition, even when you collect Brazilian books or Latin American books, the books that Latin Americans themselves collect are like the guy from Paris and the guy from New York. They don't really um, collect the books. So, but, but, you know, Latin Americans, just like Bulgarians, always went to Paris. Um, Latin Americans always went to Florida and California, and they wrote about it. And there's a long literature of them writing about it. And it's very funny how you find yourself, just by your language and your ethnicity or your background, um, writing into a tradition of imperialist something. And it's re what's really interesting is not that they're imperialist victims, because Latin Americans are not. You know, it's really similar to, um, to writing about the Arab world, for example, um, or the Turks. You know, these are imperialists who are like thwarted. 
you know? <laughs> and so, um, like, their empire didn't quite work out, or, like, their war with Bolivia didn't go as well as it was supposed to. Or, but, you know, like, they had the same plans that we had when we were conquering Nebraska, you know? Like, and it just didn't go as well. Or sometimes it did go really well, like in Brazil or in Argentina or in Chile. These were aggressively imperialist countries. But when you write about it, you, you're definitely now, because of how things have shaked out, you're definitely in the superior position in terms of the, the, the macro geographical military cultural uh, position. And so I think it's what, what um, Nikolai was saying. You have to approach any character, any culture, any place, I think, with, with love in a certain way, even if you hate them. Like, even if it, you're writing about a character who's really despicable, I think your obligation is to, and really was despicable, like there's no way to, you know, but you have to approach it from a way of, okay, yeah, that was not such a great move, but why did she or he do this? Or why did this culture develop slavery? Why did this culture decide it was okay to abuse women or whatever? I mean, there's always, every culture has these things. And so um, I think if you keep it from the, on the level of wondering rather than deciding, maybe that's a way of approaching it. Christopher? Or do you want to go on to me? Yeah. Can I just make a, a very, this is very quick, and it's really directed to um, the Bulgarian members of this panel. Uh, I've noticed, because I follow Bulgarian literature very, very closely, uh, a tremendous number now of diaspora writers, Bulgarians who live um, away from Bulgaria most of their time. Some even who don't even write in Bulgarian. They, they, they write in a new, new native language and then they get their works translated into Bulgarian. Um, and obviously uh, they're writing about Bulgaria, they're writing about their experiences in Bulgaria, sometimes very painful. But this can be greeted almost in the same way as if they're foreigners writing about Bulgaria. And I'm wondering um, how everybody sort of copes with that situation, being, uh, you know, you're, you're Bulgarian, you're living somewhere else, somehow you don't have the right to talk about Bulgaria. Or, or perhaps you do, you know, I mean, do, do what I'm, do, do, does this relate, do you relate to this? Uh. Yeah, I guess this question is directed towards me. Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, Nikolai, would you like to answer this no, question? No. Oh. Um, so, um, first, I don't think there is a person who's allowed or not allowed to write about something. You know, I don't think somebody owns narratives and somebody um, is, you know, remove, you know, sort of an outsider who's not allowed to write about this. Because there's always value in both, in both um, points of view. There is the point of view of the insider, the point of view of the outsider. I guess I'm a little bit of both. Um, I won't get, I mean, I can talk why I write in English. It's just a language that um, I feel more comfortable in a little bit. I have the language that I've spoken a little bit longer than actually Bulgarian. Too. I've read more, more books in English, at least, that I've read in Bulgarian, for sure. Uh, so, and, and to me, that language offers me a certain kind of removal from the culture I live in and a certain kind of, um, uh, sort of, obj not objectivity, but, you know, kind of, again, to use that term, the defamiliarization of, of what I know. And I think I find that helpful. Um, now, second thing is that I find it um, almost, I mean, I find it very strange when people say, oh, you're, how would you represent your culture abroad? And now, the thing is that there is no one narrative. And actually, it, I find it's, it's annoying when, when, when people say, oh, you know, this is how the Arabs represent themselves, or, you know, or how Bulgarians, or the, f the fact, or any minority, or any small country, the fact is that there are millions of narratives within that country or within that minority that oftentimes clash with each other, that oftentimes do not agree. So there is no one master narrative. And so, um, you know, you'd have 
foreign writers, for example, or a Bulgarian writer, Miroslav Penkov, for example, who writes uh, short stories in English about Bulgaria. So there are various reactions to his stories. So on the one hand, people say, oh, he exoticizes the country. He exoticizes, he does this magical realism and, and it's sort of a, um, a kind of, you know, it sort of does this almost um, uh, imperial kind of exoticization of, of you know, um, orientalization of, of, of our culture. Um, and then there are many Bulgarians who love that. There's like, this is how, this is how Bulgaria is. It's crazy and it's like, Kusturica, and it's like, you know, all these all this crazy narratives, and we love them, and Miroslav is presenting the country so accurately. And now, you know, these are Bulgarians, both talking about Miroslav's book. And so, and so I found out that, in a sense, you can, you know, you cannot, this is ridiculous to have the burden of representing an entire culture. I have the burden of representing my own view of things. But, you know, to represent Bulgaria, or to represent... You know, because I know that when you enter the country, there will be a million people agreeing with me and a million people disagreeing with me. So, so you know, I think that that kind of homogenization of, of actually foreign cultures, you know, um, oftentimes, it, I mean, it's a product, how should I say, of theory sometimes, of, you know, post-colonial theory of like, oh, look at how foreign cultures look uh, uh, onto like Arabs or Bulgarians or the Balkans. Um, but the truth is that, that there is no like single narrative and, and, and even those foreign views are sometimes internalized by the people inside the country. They see themselves like that, which is strange, but also, you know, other people. And so, so again, I'm, I'm just, I just want to emphasize that, that I don't see myself as a, as, you know, a, a, a kind of a translator of my culture because I'm just one person and, and, and another Bulgarian will represent Bulgaria in a completely different way. So, so this is, this is what I, you know, I'm just a writer and I, I try to do the best that I can with like what I see around me, but I don't want to have the cultural burden of, of being a representative of something. Sorry to jump in here, but I'll give you a, a, an example from the neighborhood, you know, uh, during the war in uh, Yugoslavia, uh, there were two narratives about our problems. Uh, one was uh, very simple, and the New York Times and many other journals had uh, this kind of uh, uh, boilerplate. Uh, one third of the article was uh, the cliches about Serbs, Croats, and so on, and it was very simple. And another, uh, another narrative, uh, another approach was that it was way too complicated and nobody will ever possibly understand what's going on in the Balkans. These uh, intricate hatreds that have been going on for thousands of years, well, totally inaccurate, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, we cannot even uh, dare to approach this area uh, or let alone uh, uh, make a judgment to whom to export the arms. Let's just have a total arms embargo and let them kill each other. That's the best. Uh, uh, well, I'm oversimplifying, but what I want to say is that uh, uh, there's the danger of uh, having a few cliches, uh, ethnic stereotypes, a bit of folklore, and, you know, when, when I walk around Bulgaria, I can see, you know, Kirill and Methodius. These very simple myths, and uh, you can, you, we have a very simplified Balkan history uh, that uh, we can function by. On the other hand, we can say it's totally unfathomable and too complex, let's just give up. Uh, and uh, I, I think both extremes are, are harmful, and the best thing is to go to individual narratives and to to use the approach uh, that Nicholas uh, spelled out uh, to uh, treat everybody with uh, love and I'd say respect uh, because everybody everybody actually has a logic according to which uh, he or she is right uh, so you can find a mass murderer and so he's just a murderer you know you can immediately resort to name calling and calling someone a murderer okay uh, maybe he was a murderer for one minute of his life so the entire life he is a murderer and we name call him a murderer. Uh, but he's still a person who has his logic and his thinking, and in order to understand uh, him, we need to go into that logic. Uh, for example, crime and punishment, you know, when you look at it from the outside, basically it's a young man who murdered two old women. I mean, how much more despicable could it get? Yet, uh, we get into the logic of uh, thinking of Raskolnikov, and we get to love him and we worry about him and we actually don't want him to be caught. We tremble with him. 
because the Skrzyzewski managed to get into his mind, show his logic, uh, and uh, also his human side, his compassion, you know, he's worried about uh, poor old people who cannot uh, afford to pay for a funeral, uh, things like that. So uh, I think that's an extraordinary achievement. Also a great example of how to treat uh, anybody. You know, you can actually write about a murderer with, uh, I won't say love, it's maybe not uh, going too far, but with respect, uh, to show the logic how it works. Uh, not just from your point of view, but find what his point of view is. Uh, it's a, a partly dangerous, maybe uh, that way nobody is actually guilty, everybody will be exonerated, but who knows, maybe that's not the worst thing to do. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. No, just really quickly, I am confronting the limits of that view right now in my personal spiritual existence because ever since the elections in the United States, I've really, I've seen this logic, this is a literary logic of a writer, of a novelist, that you see both sides and you understand it. And I see this kind of corroding my country right now, which is some people really are despicable and horrible and should be called that. And I think it's really hard for people who are on the left who tend to be people with literary educations, but maybe not only, but uh, often, um, to actually find the words to say, you're horrible and I hate you. <laughs> And I feel like now at a time of, of political danger that's a physical danger for people who are going to die because they're people who are taking away their health care and they're about to start a war with someone that they probably aren't even sure who it is yet, but they'll figure it out. Um, you know, the people are really in danger. And I find it very hard. I'm trying to write, Elif and I were sort of talking about trying to write about politics. It becomes very hard when you are pre-disallowing, if that's a word, which it's not, but if you're pre-eliminating saying somebody is wrong and despicable and not really needing to understand them, I don't really know what else I need to understand about Donald Trump that I don't already yeah, understand. Name calling won't help. I mean, to, call, to call him a moron, it stops the analysis of what's going no, on. No, I'm not calling uh, so, him a moron. I'm just yeah, but I mean, uh, not interested. To, simply, to, to, uh, to judge someone, and it, it usually uh, results in name calling. And, uh, it's best to delay name, name calling and to analyze. You know, uh, sure we have a crisis here, and we, we do have a moron for president. But uh, uh, let's uh, still uh, abstain from name calling, and uh, and uh, 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 because that that, uh, that just cuts uh, analysis and any possibility of progress. Uh, it, it's just shut off there in, in complete animosity. Uh, well, sure, maybe we need a civil war. Okay. May I may I, may I add something or? Jeremy, may, may I say something? Sorry, I didn't know where the voice was coming from. I yeah, was looking around, trying to figure out. From the speaker. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, to go back to, to the question uh, very briefly uh, about um, writing um, in a different language about your own culture. And um, I was just thinking about um, uh, Kafka's trial um, and his other books, and what's, what's amazing about his Kafka's work um, is that he, he manages to be a foreigner in his own country, um, in, um, um, in his own life and existence. And I think that that, that is kind of um, necessary for anyone uh, to, to represent something that they intimately know. Um, and for instance, but my, you know, my first impression of Americans was um, I, when I went to study there in 1992, uh, first thing that they wanted to know is what I think of them, you know? They asked, so what do you think about our country, you know? And I was there for like two hours. Uh, well, I don't know, I, I'm looking around. I, I know more about American from movies than from what I see, you know, but they really wanted to know. So what do you think? Are we great? And uh, does it look cool? Like, that's a tunnel, you know? Have you guys, have you guys seen tunnels before? And, and um, so, uh, but I think that it's, it's important. For, it, it, it's, an, it's an issue of identity, you know? We, we look at ourselves in the mirror to just check that we exist and we kind of, you know, we note certain things that we've remembered about ourselves. But, you know, it's, it's an image that we don't really internalize, you know. It's more of an assurance that we are still existing uh, and moving about. But we really want to know what other people think of us. And 
and it helps if they're foreigners, if they're outside of our family or they're from a different country. Um, we trust them more because somehow we think they're more objective. But it does help, you know, and, 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 and writing about um, trying, uh, figuring out a way to step back from, from what is very intimate and very obvious, something that you see in the mirror every day, and, and, and to look at it as a foreigner would, you know, um, and Camus also, you know, did wonderfully uh, with, with this concept. Um, and I think that that's the basis on which we, we actually come in, 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 into terms with our own existence and, and how we write about it objectively. So, so to me, writing about Bulgaria in a different language is, is very helpful. Um, it, it's uh, obviously it's an artificial construct, but it, it, it sets the stage for, for this foreignness, you know, that I can, and even if you're a photographer and, and, and you live in a town that you've lived all your life, uh, you don't notice the things that a foreigner would, would notice immediately. And, and in order to take photos that are interesting, you have to distance yourself, you know, depersonalize the space, um, you know, uh, disassociate yourself from things that are very, very well known. And then you can actually see things that you've never seen before. That's, um I just wanted to add something to the question of Angela because I think it's important and we had some uh, conversations in our group about this. For example, Chris, I don't see him here now, but for example, he lives, he's a British guy living in Palamarca in a village in Bulgaria for five years or something more. And he has exactly this question, how can I write about the history of this place? He's very interested in the history. Uh, I'm not Bulgarian, am I, have I the right to describe also some negative things and things? And I think it's a very relative question. Um, yes, I'm in a in country, what are my rights to, to do this? And I think that... Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, uh, are my observations right? And uh, have I the right to share them? And I think if we go to back to anthropology, for example, there are some very good examples which also helped me a lot in journalism, like when we go to the French anthropologist Georges Deverot, he developed this concept about the fear of the researcher, that it's very legitimate for a researcher to say, I'm afraid I don't understand. I'm afraid I will fail with understanding. And actually, you write these fears down. He wrote these fears down, and they became a part of his uh, own work after that. So the fears of the researcher helped them and are part of the, of the work. And this influenced a lot of um, so-called analytical anthropology, also in, in Switzerland, for example. Paul Parry had done a lot of work. So actually, you lead, uh, and uh, we talked with him about this, that you can uh, have your own diary every day uh, 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 about these own fears because this is very helpful to realize that actually we have our own stereotypes, our own ideas, and of course we see the culture through these lenses. So it's not just this objective view to seeing the Bulgarians objectively because there is no way to, to see this. But there are ways that we can measure it and actually use our own insecurities as part of the writing. So it becomes kind of reflective writing which helps the reader understand why we see the things like this. So this I wanted to say. Hi, I, very good panel. I, I it's on. It's on, okay. <laughs> um, all of this, uh, people are talking about having to look at the other side of somebody. You can't just look at them in one way. You have to find a kind of a love or an understanding. Um, reminds me of when I was in college, I, for one summer, I worked as a cab driver in New York City, and the first week was absolutely miserable because every week I went out and I was given a cab that broke down in some terrible way. Um, whether it was the, the, the engine just stopped or it stuttered or um, <laughs> the, um, the car alarm went off or all kinds of terrible things. Once with a storm approaching, I was given a car where when I put on the um, windshield wipers, only one windshield wiper worked, and of course it was on the passenger side. And I began to be really afraid to go to work and get a new cab. And so at the end of the week, I was telling this old timer, you know, I, I just poured my heart out to him and he listened quietly. And then he said, you know, you got to learn how to take care of your own people. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And then it dawned on me, oh, okay, I've got to pay off the guy who calls the name, and I've got to pay off the guy who puts the oil in the car and everything else. And once I've got every bri everybody bribed up, then I'm going to get a good car, which, in fact, I never got a bad car again. But the whole idea of you have to take care of your people 
is I think the best literary advice I ever got too. And it relates to something that um, is the wonderful section in James Baldwin's novel in other countries, the beginning of the third chapter, where this novelist Vivaldo is extremely tired. He's worked all day, he's worked in the bookstore, he's done this, he's moved the piano, but that's not why he's tired. It's because the characters in his novel won't talk to him. He can't do anything. They won't move around. He'll push him places and they'll go, but they won't go by themselves. He'll put words in their mouth and they'll speak, but they're not really speaking. And Baldwin says he was trying to seduce his characters as the way he was sometimes would try to seduce people. And what they were waiting for, he says, Baldwin says, is for Vivaldo to touch a nerve, turn a key, tell the truth. And he said, and then they seemed to be saying to him as characters, they would give him everything he asked for and more than he was now willing to imagine. And I think when you go to a character, whether it's a fictional character or it's a, a, a somebody that you know and you need to reimagine or better imagine when you're doing a memoir, only when you start to look at not one side, but two sides, but three sides, but four sides, will they come alive in a vibrant way. Even though it's your, your projection of who they might be, they're not going to come alive. Hi, um, I wanted to go, we talked, uh, or you guys talked a little bit about um, how important it is to write nonfiction with love, but then also sometimes a person is terrible uh, and you want to just tell them that they're stupid. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about writing about a failure of empathy, like a failure to care. Um, I think if you write or cover, if you're doing journalism, um, war and trauma and crises, after a certain point, these things just kind of become like, or they risk becoming objects on the shelf of your awareness. Um, and you have to sort of be pulling back a little bit. And I wondered if you think it's uh, possible to write and acknowledge a failure of empathy, or if that just becomes failure, if you're writing about um, inmates or migrants um, and you're aware that you are having to sort of like close part of yourself to, to write it and cover it? Well, failure is a given. I mean, failure of understanding. Uh, we, we try to go beyond that. We, we, of course, don't even understand ourselves. Uh, if it were easy, Socrates wouldn't say, know thyself, you know, uh, for a great philosopher to say, okay, know thyself, which means we don't know ourselves, let alone others. So the failure is a given, and how do we, uh, how do we transcend that failure and still make some sense and uh, do something good? That's, that's, that's the project, and it, it's obviously very hard. But it, that, uh, that's uh, part of almost every honest narrative to acknowledge the limits and the failures, and then we go hopefully beyond that. Yeah, I have had a real experience of that in the last couple of years finishing my biography of Susan Sontag because um, it becomes, Susan Sontag is a, as I said, you know, she's a great woman. She really is. She did unbelievable things and she's a person who's justly interesting and celebrated. At the end of her life, towards the end, for a lot of reasons, including drug use, um, amphetamines that she had taken all her life, not because she was having a great time, but because she always needed to work more, she was always afraid she wasn't productive enough, and if you take amphetamines, which at the time she started taking them were a pretty, you know, doctors gave them to teenagers to lose weight, you know, they weren't really like a bad drug like they are now, but they are addictive and they do change your personality, and by the end of her life, and she had cancer three times, she was a very disagreeable person, and, um, and yet I kind of loved her, you know, she's kind of awesome. But she's also really difficult, and it becomes a kind of spiritual struggle within yourself as a writer to give her her due while still being fair to the people that she hurt or to the other failures that she did, and realize that uh, you know a lot of people are failures and a lot of people are mean to the cab driver or whatever, and they aren't Susan Sontag. So actually, um, you can write, you can. There's so many failures in so many lives of all of our lives that things that we could do better or wrong, but. I think that um, if, you, if a book of any kind is successful for the reader, it's because there, that empathy is uh, available. And it's, you can feel it as a, um, as a reader. You can say like, okay, this woman was terrible because she did this to so-and-so or to so-and-so. But um, when you 
tally it all up, her net contribution to the world was positive. Now that's not always true. Like if I was writing a biography of Adolf Hitler and I was like, you know, but at the end of the day, <laughs> he really tried, you know, <laughs> like then that would be like a little bit but that, dicey. But that's not what you mean when you say you got to love, you got to write with love right. about those you right. despise or don't, don't right. love, right. right? I mean, Shakespeare loved his villains, right. meaning... Right. Wow, this is a great villain. I am going to make. I am going to realize this villain yeah. by like loving this character as fully as a lovable character. And I think people who do write about Hitler think like, I love writing about Hitler. Like, not not like, it's really making me very happy inside and right. at peace with my maker. No, but I think that at some level it's like this is. I, I love like what an incredibly huge, fecund monster this is or yeah. something. You know. It's like and I think the question you're asking though, I think that like, yes, if you can make the burnout um, part of the issue, if it's not just about you feeling kind of sick of hearing these people's stories, which by the way, Robert Stone, the novelist, wrote a great story called Helping, which starts with a psychoanalyst or psychotherapist who's got a war veteran, a, Viet a fake Vietnam war veteran coming before him, and he's a Vietnam veteran. And, and, and it's like, he was prepared to go to great lengths not to hear Blankenship's dream, right? Was, is like one of the great lines, I think, you know? And, and he's like, you weren't there. He actually lapsing back into alcohol. Yeah, he drinks himself into a stupor and imagines killing the neighbors, but that's different. Um, but I'm saying like, you know, if you make the issue like, we all burn out from hearing migrant stories, even as newspaper readers, let's say. We all get a little tired of hearing stories of people's genericized pain. You know, here's this wave after wave of people who make an appeal to conscience and, and it's really hard to absorb it. If you can make it about something more than just like, actually, I'm not sure I still care about the thing I'm writing about, that's a problem. But if you can make it about something bigger, that actually may be a really big subject that is coming to you from that. And if you can sort of take your experience and, and not feel like, wow, I, I can't write about this anymore, but oh, I'm gonna have to figure out how to make that experience the story, I think you could. Yeah, in a way, it's not that different from the question about access and to if you don't have access, to what extent can you write about not having access and problematize that and make it part of the story. With empathy, it feels a lot the same. And I've been thinking a lot about how genre or convention or like the state of um, convention, the state of what we, we know to be necessary to acknowledge. I, one place I've been feeling really conscious of a lack of empathy is um, in the subway and also um, in, in Zumba class. I, I, <laughs> I've been reading about, you know, um, irredentism and Zionism and what happened in Turkey at the end of World War I and this idea that the person who lived there the first deserves that space and I'm like, oh, how barbaric. But then I realized that when I came a little bit late to Zumba class, um, I was in someone else's space but I was like, what am I supposed to do, not exist? Like, you're going to have to deal with it. But then when someone else came a little bit after me, I was very conscious of that person coming in later, having less of a right to the space than the person who had been there before me. And I had, like, placed myself in this hierarchy. And things that seem... And you notice it on the subway, too, that you see someone who's behaving in space in a certain way, and you're like, oh, that person's not not behaving well and not standing in the subway well. But then when you're forced to be in that position of obstructing someone and you look and you see there's nowhere to go, you're like, well, what am I supposed to do, not exist? And that, <laughs> and when you're writing, I mean, every time you describe being annoyed or being hindered in some way, it's a lack of empathy. And you could be going to the other side and being, but you know, of course that person had had their day and they had, you know, <laughs> this was coming at the long end of a series of insults that they received starting from the mailman in the morning. And you have to stop somewhere. Like you're like all of the acknowledging that you do, it's, uh, it's still, I think a f there's like some formalization of the, of the gesture that, that we have to learn to do. And that's something that I've been thinking about. Speaking of being, being empathetic, I'm aware that we've all been sitting here for 90 minutes. Um, so why don't we say thank you to everyone. And, uh...